Okay. Uh, thanks everybody for joining. Really excited about this presentation by the, the CMC Markets crew. Um, essentially, they're going to present some slides and we're going to have uh, you know a great talk. Uh, as anybody who's seen me kind of talking about the CMC stuff, they've, they've got some really interesting insights around data mesh. So very, very excited about this. And then um, we'll transition into Q&A. If people have questions, can you please throw it in the Q&A specifically? So that way we have a centralized place. It's a lot easier to kind of manage that at the end. But that's kind of it for me now. So I'm going to turn it over to the, the CMC folks. And um, you'll see me again when uh, the Q&A happens. But other than that, it is their show to run. So uh, I will turn it over to you all. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, thank Scott. you, Scott. I'm going to share the slides. OK. OK, yeah, I can see. Can you see it? Yeah, yep. cool. OK. Perfect. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for joining. And um, yeah, we'd like to share a bit about, about our data mesh journey. So where we started, what we're doing now, and where we're heading. Uh, Lorenzo and I shared a bit about our journey uh, in, in different forums. So we're hoping this is an sort of an update and uh, a reformulation and yeah, a more up-to-date stuff about where we are now. So yeah, let, let's, uh, let's start. Um, so yeah, first about us, so uh, Tarek, Lorenzo and Mike, we are all uh, data engineers uh, in the uh, um, core data team at CMC. Uh, you would excuse us for using a younger and pre-pandemic pictures of ourselves, uh, but yeah, that's the three of us. We also have on, on uh, the presentation, actually, I think uh, John, at least, from, from the team, we have a, a couple of other colleagues uh, working with us on, on the stuff in the team. Good stuff. So uh, we will start by setting up the background, just explain uh, the situation at CMC Market. So we started this work uh, last November just to explain what we found. And then uh, a couple of things about uh, our specific challenges and approach to uh, introducing a data mesh. So we'll go through what we think are the uh, hopefully strongest or most ins insightful things we learned uh, along the journey. Um, we, at the end, we'll speak a bit about the, uh, try to summarize the challenges and enablers of the data mesh adoption journey and basically just summarize there. And then a couple of words at the end about um, the, the future plans and how we, we intend to take it forward. Okay, uh, so just to start, a couple of words about CMC Market. So uh, the company provides an online financial trading platform. It's fairly extensive and it has been uh, very successful for the last uh, 30 years. Uh, you don't need to be an expert in finance at all uh, to, to understand the things we'll be talking about. It's more about the data aspects in, in general. Uh, but you could imagine that uh, because of the nature of the business, we can easily describe it, describe it as data centric, which means every single function in the business relies heavily on, on the data to do its job. So you can think of risk management, uh, marketing, uh, trading, pricing, everything is heavily based around uh, the data. So the other thing, interesting thing about CMC Market around the time we joined is that there is a transformation initiative uh, in place. And the main goal is what you can expect is basically to enable the business to innovate rapidly and build new uh, products. And now the, the, the key uh, the components or principles of the um, Transformation is the adoption of public cloud, which is AWS. Uh, we're doing a lot of work on that, but as we will see, there's also there are many systems that exist on premise that we need to accommodate. We are adopting a cross-functional squad delivery model. Uh, Self-service is a big component of the transformation, and the goal is to enable teams to be autonomous and basically enabled, not to have dependency on many other things and so on. You could all already see that many of the ingredients of the transformation are uh, similar to what we'd expect the data mesh to, to, to provide. Uh, okay, so now let's talk about um, uh, where, where, where data fits at uh, the, uh, with, with the transformation. So um, the, the, main, the main issue around the data is that we have um, so the business doing transformation is building new products on the cloud, but all the valuable data is on existing systems, and these systems are on premise. Why is that? Uh, there are a couple of reasons. One are historical reasons, because the company is just adopting the public cloud, 
but also in finance, it's fairly common uh, to want to co-locate things. So we expect certain systems to remain on uh, privately managed infrastructure for the foreseeable future. But this is basically a gap that we need to, to bridge. How do we allow this rapid innovation, new products on the cloud, uh, while taking advantage of existing data on, on premise? So uh, one thing here, just to summarize the situation that we, we sort of observed when we started, um, TMC is very different from other uh, enterprises, just for example, banks or larger enterprises, where often we find that the issue uh, is having a big, massive, monolithic data platform. In CMC, uh, the data was already decentralized. Uh, so that's a good thing. However, it was decentralized uh, and siloed at the same time, which is the main challenge we had to address. And I will explain that a bit, uh, a bit more in detail later. But what does it mean for the data to be siloed? It means that you have the knowledge of the data and the ability to do and use work on the data. Uh, they're basically a coupled in, in single teams. So if you need to do anything useful with the data, you need to find the team uh, with the data you need, and then you need to ask them to do the data for you, uh, which is obviously not great for, uh, um, in, in terms of uh, lean process, so that's a form of waste, and in terms of autonomy and the ability to, to uh, innovate. Uh, the other thing we noticed is that, uh, so there's a lot of great knowledge of, of the data and the technologies in the organization, however, there are limited convention standards and norms across teams, uh, which is also does not uh, help with uh, uh, this decentralized and enablement model. So, um, can you move next? Okay, so, so anyone in, in the business who needs to use the data would need to ask, so these are common questions that need to be answered. So, where's the data I need? Uh, if I find it, how can I understand it? What does it mean? Can I trust it? Uh, how, how do we actually make this data available for new products, for example, on the cloud, as I said. But generally, how do we actually enable scale uh, and innovation uh, at the same time? Okay, so before uh, going into the, uh, uh, more the details of how we implement data mesh, I would just like to illustrate what I mentioned now with just um, visually with an example. So imagine that you have a new product here at the top with a product owner uh, in, in green. Basically, then you have uh, three different teams here. Uh, each team has their own data, and the data has is siloed in that it hasn't been designed for the consumption of other teams. It's been just optimized for the usage of that specific uh, team that owns it. Sometimes uh, this data is owned by the team that naturally looks after it. Sometimes it's just owned by uh, potentially technical custodians, for example, of the data. So the first question is, where's the data? That's anyone needs, and there's no specific way to answer that aside from just coming in asking around. We ask this question and then let's say, oh yeah, I, I know, I need some data from the uh, blue team and then I need also some data from the, um, from the yellow team here. So uh, after you found the data, you need to ask for specific work to be done for you to adapt the data that has been shaped for the requirements of the team that own them for your own consumption. So again, this, as I said, results in a lot of ad hoc work uh, queuing and also unplanned work for the teams that own the data because uh, you can't do anything unless you go and, and ask them to do the work for you and they cannot anticipate what we want to do. Um, so this is a bit the, just trying here to illustrate the, um, the impact of having a, a siloed data model on the uh, delivery and innovation. So now uh, I would like to hand over to Mike just to talk about, sorry, Lorenzo, I think it's you. Uh, yeah, 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 it's so, me. yeah the, the fundamental question that we need to answer, okay, so we want the data mesh, what goes inside the data mesh then? So, uh, up to you. So yeah, the, the, the first question is, <clears throat> what data goes inside the, uh, of the data mesh? What, what is in scope of the data mesh and what is not? And the, well, in the literature around the uh, data mesh, well, course, the, the uh, articles uh, by Jamak, but also other plot posts by other people, usually people refer to uh, uh, an analytical and operational data planes. Beware, they, they talk about data planes, not about data. Uh, and the, the thing is that data uh, is neither analytical nor operational. Use cases are analytical or operational, and this is very different. And from our point of view, analytical and operational planes actually describes systems. 
in terms of well the people, the software, and the the, the, the physical, uh, the the infrastructure system, not the data itself. And th this difference is subtle but very very important. So effectively. Uh, uh, Looking at the data, especially in, a, in an, an organization that is very uh, data driven, very de data centric as CMC, but I'm sure we are not we are, we are not exclusive in that. There is no real distinction between the two, and the the distinction between analytical and operational uh, 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 data is totally artificial. There are use cases they are analytical and there are use cases they are uh, operational and actually this is a range it's not a, a, a binary uh, one or the other but again this is not a good criterion for deciding uh, what data should i manage uh, as part of the data mesh uh, as a data mesh and what data i, I should not uh, uh, on board in the data mesh so we, we essentially use two key ideas for, for this. One is the concept of data on the inside versus data on the outside. We borrowed this from, uh, actually is, is a quite old article from, well, quite old uh, in our field, of course, uh, from Pat Helland. Uh, there is a research article uh, from uh, 2005. He was talking about uh, uh, service-oriented architecture at the time, but the concept applies very well. Uh, I will get to that in, uh, in a minute. And the other key idea is uh, uh, finding fundamental data sources in the organization. So data on the inside and data on the outside, uh, um, what does it mean in the context of the, uh, of the data mesh? Well, um, sorry, ju just I, I'm assuming that the, the attendees are kind of familiar with the basic concept of the data mesh. So uh, apologies if I'm, uh, I'm making this assumption, but well, one thing that is central in the data mesh is the, is the, is the business domain. It is the same concept as in, in, in domain-driven design. So data should be designed and shared across, uh, 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 um, following the business domains. And so the data on the inside are exactly the data they are internal to domain they are not shared with other domains why data on the outside are the data they are shared with other domains and we need to identify uh, data that are, are, are of common interest across the organization and these are the data on the outside and as i mentioned we borrowed this concept from pat Allen. i i put the links uh, on the bottom of this slide we will share the slide so the link will be available the original article again is from 2005 uh, pat was uh, talking about uh, service oriented architecture so databases versus web services uh, the, the tools are very different and but it's still valid actually the, the very same idea was recovered uh, uh, about the microservices. So I also put the link uh, of one of the articles, specifically one by Adrian Collier, who was uh, using exactly the same concept, talking about uh, uh, microservices. Actually, recently, Pat Allen went back to the same concept that published a, a new, uh, recently, one, uh, one year ago, published another article, uh, and there is a, the link as well. Um, the thing is, Okay, uh, data on the outside are the scope of our data mesh. And w w why do we need to have this kind of criteria? Well, because when you are onboarding some data on the data mesh, you need to make a data source. For example, you need to make it well, discoverable. Uh, it has to be shaped to be uh, easily consumable. Uh, every change needs to be managed. The interface, the schemas, and the, the, the content, the semantics need to be very, very clear. And any change to that need to be carefully managed. Uh, and this is hard work. And this actually uh, uh, well, requires a, a bit of overhead. Uh, so you can't just manage all the data uh, uh, this way. But having this distinction also provides the benefit of defining a clear boundary a clear interface between the domains uh, uh, talking about uh, when we are talking about data. And if you're familiar with the, 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 the concept around microservices, this is very, very similar to that. The only thing is, 
uh, in microservices, usually the idea of the interface between the domains is reduced or oversimplified sometimes as uh, REST API. We are not talking about REST API. We are more talking about a logical interface between the domains. But again, this, this concept is, is very, very similar to that. The other idea I mentioned is the uh, fundamental data sources. So uh, we decided to find these fundamental data sources and, and tackle them first. And these uh, are our primary targets for introducing uh, them to the data mesh. Uh, uh, and what, what do I mean with fundamental data source? Well, if you look at the data uh, in an organization, you will find that there are some, usually few, relatively few uh, data sets uh, or data source. They are authoritative <clears throat> and they are primary. Primary means that they're not derived <clears throat> Sorry, uh, uh, just to make a very practical example in the domain of trading. Uh, well, we have, uh, uh, for example, a couple of very clearly fundamental data sources for us are tradable prices, the stream of tradable prices, and trades, trades execution. These are clearly fundamental data sources for us. A data source or a data set that is not fundamental, even though it is very, very important, is a profit and loss not because this is not important, but because this is derived by the others. And well, a fundamental data source also needs to be important and central to, to the organization. So uh, it can't be you know, an ancillary data source. And uh, need to have a clear ownership. So you need to have a team, a domain, or, and a team built around this domain that clearly owns this. And if you don't have that, you have to identify that. And, and uh, actually, usually there is a, a team, there is a domain who is producing this data, uh, but sometimes uh, data are owned technically by someone else. So what is our, our approach here to, 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 to tackle the, the data mesh? Well, we, our approach is very data centric and heuristic. So we observe the data. Uh, uh, we observe how the data moves across the organization and we identify the fundamental data source and we start building the data mesh with them. And this is opposed to, uh, uh, let's say, more traditional approach, uh, ivory tower approach, I would say, where, uh, I, I don't know, uh, I've seen this in some banks uh, uh, working as a consultant, where you have a committee of very traditional enterprise architects deciding how things should be and then being us upset when the reality doesn't match their thinking well we, we, our approach is totally different we are observing and we are adjusting when of course we make hypotheses but when the reality doesn't match the hypothesis we adjust and we reiterate um and another uh, 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 by the way this approach uh, uh, emerged from when we started uh, the work and we start building uh, a map we, had, we tried building a map of the data flows in the business. And it was very, very clear that uh, there were a few fundamental data sources uh, and all most of the data were derived from them. And I'm sure this is true for many organizations as well. And the last point, uh, 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 very, very important, Mike, we talk about that, is we are building on a very strong uh, platform baseline, cloud and non-cloud. And this is absolutely important. Uh, I'm using the analogy of the microservices as well, uh, again, and this is the same thing as, well, for building microservices, you need to have uh, DevOps practices and you need to have a strong uh, platform services, let's say. You can't do it without that. What we don't do is uh, uh, we are not starting from a technology. We didn't pick a technology and adopt it and then start looking for use cases for that. And also what we are uh, not doing, what we are carefully trying to avoid is uh, consolidating and linking the existing data silos. Because the, some of the silos are actually just uh, technical custodians of the data. And we are looking for the real business domains and the teams that are around them, uh, uh, they are producing the data or owning the data. And last point, uh, probably the most important, we are carefully avoiding building point-to-point -point data integrations because the, the risk, well, the, uh, you will eventually ending up 
uh, with a spaghetti integration. You will eventually end up reinventing uh, or, or, or ending in the enterprise service bus uh, nightmare anti-pattern uh, that becomes unmanageable. Uh, if you serve uh, just one consumer usage and you design just for that, and then you, 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 you go to the next one, you uh, eventually, you will start building yet another uh, different integration and then yet another and then yet another and that will be uh, totally unmanageable. Uh, this point is, is not easy because you, you need to strike the right balance be between being consumer driven because you need to be consumer driven but also to be proactive. And I pass to Mike. Thank you Lorenzo. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Brilliant. Uh, so I'll talk about the different aspect of data mesh. Uh, this is the infrastructure or the platform. So um, as, a, as the core data team, we are responsible for building data infrastructure for the products we create. So we build, we, we run, we manage, we monitor the infrastructure as well as the application. So this is, uh, I'm sure it is very known pattern uh, in other other parts of the of the system, uh, but what we do, we do not start. We didn't start from the scratch. Uh, we and we don't work in isolation. We reuse existing systems and tools as much as it's practical. In our case, it means that we build on on top of other company-wide cold shared services. Uh, mainly, what we do now is cloud solution built by others as part of the transformation program. So we we'll mentioned transformation a couple of times, but this is important that we are part of the transformation and we are trying to build data uh, systems in a very similar way rather than just trying to build something uh, very unique or very difficult to, for others to, to understand. So we collaborate with other teams um, to share the skills and, and to, which, which of course help us to build uh, data infrastructure is just like any other infrastructure. And thanks to existing cloud services, we can start building much faster uh, and begin solving problems more quickly rather than just uh, spending time uh, on building the core infrastructure networking or basic resources in the cloud. We already have this and we could build on top of it, which is very useful and this is a very good pattern to follow, I think. Uh, and of course, we do infrastructure, infrastructure as a code, nothing, nothing special here. We also try to use higher level services provided by the cloud platform. Uh, this is, of course, to lower maintenance, overhead, lower build time and effort, but we always validate these tools. Um, uh, often data systems require different infrastructure resources than, for example, web services. Uh, we will be talking a little bit about a system called Aaron, uh, which uh, we, 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 we do, and it definitely requires different type of infrastructure. You cannot build it on serverless. Um, but, uh, but for example, we we use containers to make development and, and deployment process as streamlined as possible. So we, we are very conscious about choices of tooling. Uh, it's basically, if we can reuse uh, the same tools that everyone else uses, we, we always do it. So a good, good example of a colleague who joined from other team and he is able to pick up most of my work on infrastructure because it's very similar. There's, of course, some specifics related to the products we build, but most of the, the infrastructure is very similar and very familiar to, to, to my colleague. Um, Self-serve, in here, here I'm referring to self-serve as a um, way to simplify provisioning of infrastructure. And I can say that definitely it's our goal to, to, to build uh, or to, to enable other teams to create their own distributed data systems. Uh, but of course, um, it's quite often difficult to achieve 
from from my experience, the real life is, is different. Uh, there are plenty of edge cases, actually, there are very, you know, use case, different use cases. Um, and technology is changing very fast. So it's difficult to build in a way that it's just uh, very easy to deploy something. But with some collaboration and cross-functional squads, we can achieve uh, very smooth uh, infrastructure provisioning, which is acquired in the data much so rather than just uh, because of the barriers in provisioning infrastructure, people used to just use one central system. And of course, in data mesh, uh, we try to avoid it. Uh, what I like to just mention that for me, this is a DevOps transformation in data. I know that it sounds very, very strange, but uh, sometimes the data, data teams are siloed still uh, and Definitely what we're trying to do is to, to work in a DevOps uh, model. Uh, a couple of words about tools we use. Again, uh, it's definitely not uh, the only way of doing it. It's just the tools we know and uh, it makes sense for us to use. So we use cloud, AWS. Uh, we infrastructure, infrastructure as a code is Terraform. Uh, we make changes with um, CICD and GitHub Actions. I mentioned containers. Uh, again, I'm sure this is a very familiar uh, tool set uh, to, to many people who work outside of the data. Uh, probably, yeah, one more uh, note here is about the hybrid platform model that we, we, we have. So we need to build on both cloud and on-prem, and this is a relatively common requirement in many enterprises. Uh, and we, we, it was a significant effort, engineering effort, to use the same tools and processes for both platforms. So the idea was that we wanted to use the same tooling and the same way of building and deploying application on both on, on the cloud and on-prem. Um, we actually managed to do that uh, with a, a reasonably new service in AWS called ECS Anywhere, uh, which allows us to uh, use ECS for container management. Uh, we could add on-prem hosts as a part of the one central place and deploy and manage everything with, with ECS and actually in Terraform. So it is a good a good advice if, if you get a similar uh, requirement and you could use AWS tools because there are many other ways of doing it. Uh, so we've got one single infrastructure container cluster uh, running application both on-prem and and on AWS and we can monitor and, and see the, the whole system as one. Uh, Lorenzo, can you go to the next slide, please? So data discovery and uh, data discovery is essential capability in any organization that attempts to, to adopt data mesh, uh, any organization that have more than a couple of distributed data stores or systems and more than a, a couple of teams of people that needs to know what data is available, how to access this data and how to use this, this, this data. Uh, then data discovery is, is essential. And we found it very useful uh, for both data consumers and data owners. Uh, data discovery tool needs to be human friendly. So it's actually for people to, to go to, 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 to find data, to search for data. Uh, it's it's not, not like a, uh, data catalogs, which I mentioned in a moment. Um, in, in here, I refer to serve service as a, from a slightly different perspective than I mentioned for infrastructure. This is the, um, the ability to access information about data. Uh, so this is a starting point to find data and to do it without asking others or logging a ticket for others, other teams to provide this information. 
and also to find the information of uh, new ways of uh, connecting different data sources, uh, building something new out of the existing data. Uh, for data owners, it's a clear entry point to onboard new data sources. Uh, it's, so this is a central place uh, when data owners need to or should publish metadata. So it's a curation of the metadata on top of the uh, responsibility of the data itself. And it's more than the data catalog we already use a glue catalog which is very useful but it's it's used for the etl pipelines rather than for people to, to browse and understand the data uh, we use the data catalog as a part of the data sources that are enriched for for human consumption uh, next slide please and to be more practical in, in here we are uh, we'll just talk about Amundsen. This is a, a tool that we are trying now. Um, it's still emerging, uh, which means that it's got very, fairly limited functionality. Uh, it's definitely lacking lots of enterprise um, features. Uh, it's uh, and it's very much uh, unlike uh, other big off-the-shelf products, uh, which for us is actually um, a good thing. Um, it doesn't that the tool doesn't enforce the way of ingesting data presenting data or, or or deciding what kind of data we've got this is something which we need to uh, discuss and and add to the tool so monson has got a great community and traction uh, so i'm very hopeful for the future the tool will uh, be developed and we'll have you know, more features uh, it's open source. Uh, again, we found that there is lots of work required to make it work, especially around um, the way data is ingested into the into the tool. It's got simple architecture. It's got cloud friendly. We deploy. We already deployed on serverless on AWS using Fargate. Uh, just a simple front end with two backend services. One is the metadata that uses the graph database as a, as a store, and the other service is search using Elasticsearch. Um, very clean, very simple. Uh, it's fairly easy to deploy um, on AWS, very low maintenance. Um, so I would recommend looking at the two. Of course, there are a couple others. We just decided this one at the time when we it, uh, research was looked the best. And this is a screenshot of the uh, instance we are running. Uh, it's an example of Oracle Data Warehouse um, table with the description. This is um, currently, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's typed manually for the, the, the data owner. Um, we've got some information about who owns the data. So it's very useful for uh, data consumers to find more information, be able to uh, figure out who owns data and how to get access to, to the data and more information when needed. Tags are used for search. So we could tag uh, different uh, data sources with the same tag and um, data consumers could see uh, similar data sources based on, based on tagging. Uh, on the right, just example of columns uh, and some description and column statistics. Um, probably, probably this the, the description is very important, so so we could understand how to connect data. There is some more functionality, but we won't go into the into the detail, details at this point. And I think that's it for me for now. Right. Yeah, thank you. So um, one of the main uh, fundamental principles of data mesh is making data natively accessible. Uh, interesting to see what that actually means for us, because as I mentioned, we have a hybrid uh, environment. So again, just quick reminder, we have a new products built on the cloud, but the valuable data is on premise. How do we solve this problem? Again, we consciously decided not to take um, 
uh, enterprise service bus like uh, data integration point to point approach, which is actually a good short term solution, but a bit short sighted in terms of scaling and the data mesh and enabling teams to consume the data they need uh, uh, without requiring a specific ad hoc uh, uh, integration every time. So to, to explain it, so I'll just take an example uh, of some of the work we are doing now, which probably requires a whole presentation in itself, but uh, I'll skip on some of the technical details. Uh, but one of the fundamental data sources that we uh, uh, started working with uh, that we are trying to make available on the cloud is tradable prices. So this is a low latency uh, stream uh, of pricing picks. They are generated by CMC, so it's a fundamental uh, data source for us so that is internal. And as I said, we need to bridge this gap, which is how do you make this data available low latency still on, uh, on the cloud. So the solution we are building is actually um, a bridge sort of architecture that I will show in a diagram based uh, on a technology called Aeron, which is an open source, low latency, reliable transport, uh, if, if you wish. Uh, the, the bridge is high fidelity, so it just transfers the data. It basically um, does not alter the data or the domain. And this is very important. We do no computation or transformation. It's just about making the data available. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an intensive investment for us in terms of our time and what we're trying to achieve, but we think it's a key enabler uh, uh, um, to, to, for a data mission, one of the key capabilities that then can be uh, scaled. Once we have the data on the cloud, that data can be used to feed into multiple uh, views. So can we just move to the next slide? Okay, so this is just a schema to, to illustrate what I've been talking about. So uh, at the bottom in blue, you can see the pricing domain generating the pricing ticks. Each color here represents a different domain. Uh, at the top, we have the AWS cloud environment. So for example, we have new products like the green one, and we have the trading engine on premise that also relies on the pricing tick. So the Aeron low latency bridge is in the middle. Uh, it takes all the ticks and makes them available in a reliable and scalable way. Then these ticks can be taken and then fed into different views, it can be time series view. It can be an event log on Kafka or if you're on DynamoDB or what have you. Uh, on top of that, if you move to the next slide, so on top of that, uh, we have the data discovery capability, which is part of the data mesh, the shared capability that then can um, uh, index if you want to ingest and make available the description of the different way this data can be consumed. Again, what's interesting to see is that we have different domains, the domains are decentralized. And what we are doing is simply extending the pricing do domain onto the cloud, as opposed to uh, creating a specific uh, sort of ad hoc integration. Okay, uh, so, um, so, so these are some of the things we, we basically wanted to cover. Now I would like just to move into the uh, adoption of the data mesh. And I'll use this slide just to uh, touch onto some of the questions I, I saw uh, and try to answer. Um, and some of them we might answer at the end. I think it's worth revisiting the uh, data sources at the end and fundamental data sources that are inside and the outside, because people have questions about uh, specific use cases for that. But one thing to understand is that as a core data team, we do not police how people use the data. We are not there for that. We are not there also to deliver on every single use case. We are there as enablers. It's because the company is data centric, it's impossible to, to scale the any data team to cover all the requirements of the company because that would be a team as, as big as the company. So um, the, the, the ideal target for us here you can see is you have different data domains that are well identified. And yes, that's, that does require a transformation context because you need to restructure things around the data domains. There's a clear distinction between data uh, on the inside in, in cylinder shape here, which is internal to each team and they can they are free and autonomous to choose the best implementation, the best format, the best mapping. For example, on the bridge we have, we are using a format called SPE, which is low latency, um, very optimized uh, for finance use cases, but not necessarily easy to consume for uh, someone, for example, writing a web application in Node.js. But that's our choice for the data on the inside uh, for the bridge. Then you have data on the outside, which is exposed and optimized for consumption, which means that you have the data owners who have a responsibility of uh, um, looking after this data, describing it and making it available. That's their part being good data citizens in the company. So this is what federated, it's more federated and decentralized mean 
we don't police these things, but then there are a number of things like uh, the uh, change management for the data, what schemas, how do you manage change, uh, data protection, data governance, and so on. So uh, what we found from experience, it's a bit like DevOps, it's impossible to seed experts into every single concern in each team. That is not realistic, not possible. So what we have, we have the SMEs, the subject matter experts in the middle, facilitating and contributing to different deliverables, uh, supported by the squad, so the, um, uh, 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 the squad delivery model. So this is basically roughly the, the, the conceptual idea we are trying to, to, to move towards. Cool. Okay. okay. This is me. Yep. Uh, thank you, Tarek. Uh, so, well, as Tarek mentioned, the uh, date, building a data mesh needs a transformation. Uh, this is a requirement. They, they have to go together. Uh, and data mesh and trust and transformation or organizational transformation need to go side by side and need to share some of the fundamental principles. Uh, so yes, a data mesh is not just a technology, uh, as I already mentioned. It's not just a change in technology. It needs to have a, a broader scope because it touches uh, multiple parts of the business, possible all of them or most of them, and need to. Uh, force a, a, a shift in mindsets in, in the, within the organization, in the people, in the way they approach the data use case and the integration uh, uh, between uh, the different domains and the different teams. And also the data mesh and the transformation need to share the same ethos, the same principles. They need to be decentralized and they need to promote collaboration uh, uh, for example, well, uh, one example is uh, adopting the, the, the squad delivery model and need to allow to scale and promote autonomy. And also uh, need to be based on the uh, strategic domain driven design foundation ideas. So uh, I'm talking here about the business domains. So you have to identify the business domains, identify them clearly and shape the teams and the systems around the business domains. And again, this is not different from microservices for who is familiar with that, where you have to reorganize your teams and your systems around the domains and, and again, adopt DevOps practices uh, to, to do it. Mm -hmm. Tarek? Oh, yeah, thank you. So I was busy answering some questions. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. So again, um, uh, we, we, we hopefully will cover more of the questions that people have in mind. Uh, uh, we're almost finished with the slides, so we can in, in the um, discussion. Uh, but while data mesh is very compelling and we do believe in it and we've been taking concrete steps towards uh, introducing a data mesh, it's not exactly a piece of cake. Uh, there are many challenges to be addressed. Uh, one of them is that data mesh is, uh, I would add, disruptive long-term investment. So again, we, we saw a lot in the sort of extended community, people talking about just linking a couple of databases or data lakes and then calling this a data mesh. Any technology only or technology-driven solution for us is not, does not, will not, um, we don't want to be purist, but will not deliver on the promise uh, of a data mesh. So it really is more aligning the technology, the process and so on. Uh, so this is obviously a challenge in terms of using, uh, finding the right use case, uh, working with the people, finding what would work for them, but also delivering on the long-term uh, principles of the, of the data mesh and not going for ad hoc solutions. So that means that you need uh, buy-in and commitment from the broader business. And this does not just happen like that. Uh, there's a lot of effort, a lot of education uh, involved in that, a lot of discussions, prioritization, but let's say it works well with an agile uh, squad-based delivery model where you have people with different skills and you identify what needs to be done and then you work uh, in small iterations. Uh, the other thing is that you can make a plan, but business priorities can and do shift and sometimes very quickly. So you need to be in a position to uh, uh, react to that. Um, and in general, as, as a transformation, as a change, it does challenge the established structures and ways of working, not because they are bad, but because they are different. As with any change, uh, you need to put some effort before you start seeing improvements, and this might have an impact on what we have now. But also, as with any transformation, you're hoping to achieve things that you cannot 
achieve with what you've built so far. So that usually motivates the, the change. But, but yeah, it, it doesn't, so change in general generates friction. And we, we haven't, it's not a friction in our case based on people not wanting the change, but it's again, the whole system working in a specific way and uh, sometimes for good reasons. For example, as I mentioned, uh, the pricing stream is on premise for, uh, for specific people. Uh, to add to that, we have the hybrid technology landscape. And this is a challenge because we did not approach this as a cloud migration uh, um, uh, exercise. This would have been suicidal for the data mesh. We very quickly identified that we have existing data on premise. We have new systems on the cloud. We have to mesh them together, if I may, uh, uh, reconcile them so that everything works as a cohesive system. So these are some of the challenges we, we came across. Uh, Mike, do you want to cover some of the enablers that we... Yeah, definitely. So the slide here is a very good sum up of uh, most of the topics we discussed uh, already. Uh, transformation program uh, is definitely needed. It's a key enabler for data mesh. Uh, again, I won't, won't go into details. We discussed this already. Uh, I definitely uh, benefit lots, a lot from the infrastructure, or cloud, shared services transformation within company, massive help for me. Cloud adoption and self service, uh, this is a key. Uh, if you don't use a cloud for your data systems, it doesn't have to be cloud, uh, but it definitely needs to be a modern way of building infrastructure with automation, infrastructure as a code and lowering the barrier for developers to create new infrastructure. Squad delivery model, uh, cross-functional teams, it's impossible to have you know, to have every team member know everything. Uh, but if we've got all the key skills covered in a squad, it's definitely a um, good thing. Small expert team uh, can think to respond to a change. Uh, what we do and what data mesh is uh, pretty much is, is di difficult to predict the outcome of the work. Uh, so a small team, like some sort of Kanban board works well for, for, for delivery and attack problem from the different angles. Uh, very important is to use the use case, find the use cases that could validate approach which could build something that could be demonstrated and that something that can create traction and, and people getting interested in in the in the in data mesh and the new ways of doing uh, data systems. Uh, data discovery definitely can enable people to uh, to see the data. So data is distributed metadata could be should be centralized and it should be searchable and make fundamental data data sources consumable and share educate uh, this is very important uh, one team cannot do uh, data much uh, one team could lead it perhaps or could start the, the work but it's needed to share the knowledge educate people um, and try to to spread the the, the, the data mesh to as many teams as possible. That's it. Very last one. Uh, I, I promise I will be super quick. Well, what, what is next? What's the future? Well, it's the greater growing of the data mesh. Uh, uh, this is not a big bank approach. Of course, this will never work. And we have to admit is a slow start building it, but hopefully it will ramp up uh, and, and get speed uh, and practically for us will we'll mean onboarding more fundamental data sources we started with tradable prices as we mentioned we are a good point with that we are hoping to start tackling other fundamental data sources very soon uh, another point is the adoption of uh, data discovery that has been mentioned many times the adoption itself is a bit challenging because uh, uh, to have perceived uh, uh, value it has to attain a, a critical mass. But of course, this is a, an egg and chicken problem. 
But w once, hopefully, once we start uh, again getting speed, uh, getting more speed, this will uh, um, this will make the uh, uh, much more viable for the organization to uh, uh, have more, to bring more use cases, more database, uh, sorry, data consuming use cases, uh, move to the cloud. And that's it. Apologies, we are uh, far. Longer than we expected, but um, can, can we address some of the questions now? Is that... Yeah, that that's great. Yeah, um, thanks so much for the awesome presentation. And, and uh, uh, Tarek, you've been answering a bunch in in the uh, Q and A already. So if you could uh, point out a few uh, around okay. what were some good questions and 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 some of the answers as well. So that way, as well yeah. for the recording, we have that that, and I will. Uh, copy paste some of the stuff um, into a doc. So we'll post that on the YouTube link so people will have that, um, the, the written answers that you've given. But if there's a few questions that you really liked in there that yeah, you yeah, want to yeah. highlight, and as people have additional questions, please do throw them in the Q&A. We're, <laughs> we're here to, to, to help you on that. So, so um, just maybe answering a few questions with the clarification, hopefully. So there was a question from Mark about uh, data products. So the first thing is to, my understanding, the way I understand data products is a bit the interpretation that is in the book, uh, The Design of Everyday Things, which is basically data as an appliance with clear ways to interact with it and do useful stuff with. And I think um, uh, Jamak mentioned, mentioned that. So this is how I interpret it. So in terms of data products, we, we consciously decided to have an inside out heuristic or approach to data mesh. So rather than going and telling people, oh, you should do this with the data, or you should do that. We actually started from the assumption people in the organization understand their data more than we do. And this is uh, very easy to demonstrate. So we went from the finding the capabilities that need to be built to enable a decentralized and data mesh model. So then we go into actually, when you have a data mesh, the first thing you would want is to find the data. So data discovery is a day one concern, not the day 10 concern. And this is why we prioritize that. The other thing is that if you're building uh, new products on the cloud, but you don't have access to the data or the access is painful or delayed or what have you, then that's also a futile exercise. So this is why we, we went into, okay, we actually need to build something that enables that. And then these early um, uh, successes, hopefully, will provide the traction and will be able to scale. But this is what we do as a team. We do not police how people use the data. We do not... Uh, enforce things, but we work with people who might have this concern. For example, um, we have data protection as a concern in the company. Uh, but then, as I said, because all the company is doing something with data, the best way to address this is more in a cross-cutting concern, uh, cross-cutting way. And then we can help with the way to um, choice of technology implementation advice and what have you. So we have many hats that we uh, put on, and now we're putting the hat of implementing the bridge, for example, we're working intensely on it. Uh, and I'll, I'll give a little bit of context. So the question was, you know, we were talking about data products, but not necessarily data as a product, data product thinking. What you just said is data as a product and data product thinking. Um, but there's this general concept around the term data product outside of data mesh, mm -hmm. uh, where a lot of times it can be data on the inside specifically or things like that. So um, it, it, I would say that that your approach is, you know, very much in line with what uh, Jamak has, has said and that kind of data as a product. But I think the question was just, you're, you're not specifically saying that phrase. And within data, yeah. da data mesh, there's intentionality around your data product as to your consumers matter. <laughs> and that, that we're exactly. actually creating this as a product. So like your design of, of everyday things um, is exactly that, that thing of people can interact with it, so. Yes, yes, exactly. In terms of, there were a bunch of questions about uh, that there might be multiple data sources in an enterprise and then how do we enforce the schema and things like that. Um, in, in general, I'll give an answer that it depends, obviously, but uh, generally one of the advantages of data mesh that you don't, want, you don't need to go in a world where there's one solution that fits all problems. There was, for example, a question about uh, data virtualization, which is useful, but there's no one tool that will solve every problem in the data mesh. So the idea is to enable people to innovate and to have some autonomy in the areas that they understand well. And 
no one understands as much as they do, the people who own the data. However, you can't live in a federated or decentralized world if you don't have a common language or if you don't all contribute to the common good. And this is when it's important to have um, uh, schemas, so contracts for the data. For us, the contract go beyond the schema. The schema is important, but then there are other things, uh, processing guarantees, um, uh, SLAs, freshness, uh, availability, what have you. So there are different attributes to, to describe the data. This is another reason why we thought that we needed a data discovery uh, um, uh, tool fairly early on, and this is why we've been experimenting with that and filing Amundsen for that reason. So uh, in terms of questions that have been asked, um, we, we encourage strongly that people use uh, a schema. You can't consume the data as a consumer if you don't have a schema. It means you still need to go and ask, which goes back to the data being siloed because you're not advertising how the data should be consumed. In terms of then how this does not turn into chaos if anyone does what they want, this is the bit about the federated model. It's not a free for all. People do what they want. They still need to contribute to common good. So if they publish a data set, they need to look after it. And then there's this requirement and so on. Um, the whole thing is underpinned and driven by the, uh, the delivery framework, which helps us prioritize what comes first and, and so on and so forth. How are you approaching kind of harmonization? So a lot of this is as well as like, how are you, you know, you think about a downstream data product um, and, and this actually brought up another question where you um, in your figure, again, it was just a simple figure. So we don't want to over extrapolate from it, but are all of your data products, the source of the data in a data product, either from the domain itself or from another data product. And, you know, when you create that, downstream data product that has data from multiple different data products and that may be cross domains, how do you, or, or have you started to approach that harmonization yeah. or how are you doing that? How, how do you think about um, enforcing that specification or creating those specifications so people yeah. don't have to, um, you know, the consumer, it's not all on the consumer to come up with an interesting way of combining the data, yeah, yeah. but there is uh, uh, something that the self-serve isn't just around creating and producing data products, it's around the self-serve side for the consumers. Yeah, um, so again, a few elements here. One is that, again, we decided not to wait to have an idealized view of all the uh, fundamental data sources and then to do a big bang migration. So we do accept that in the meanwhile, people still need to consume data. Some of this data might be derived, might not be the best possible form, but might be popular, for example. So that's fine. We need to surface these things so that we know if there's three ways of computing one value, we need to know so that then we can actually converge to one little by little. So that's in terms of uh, us approaching that. Then there are the other things about uh, uh, the data actually causing genuine pain points for people building products. So you build product, how do you get the data? Currently you need to go and ask multiple teams and it will work for you and with all the disruption that we explained at the beginning. So um, uh, the, the pain points are uh, a powerful uh, motivator then we are in that logic of enablement and working on uh, um, to enable specific product that might be priority for example. Uh, um, uh, while implementing things that are aligned with the uh, data mesh. So again, the bridge with pricing will serve one, then two, then multiple products. And then if you take the bridge, we can add to it either more data sources or different views for the same data source. For example, the pricing view can end up in a time series or an event log. Um, and also other operational things like resiliency and so on. So with time, by building these capabilities and addressing different points one by one or different deliverables, we're hoping to uh, nudge the company and converge towards uh, a bigger uh, data mesh. Because its transformation cannot be an all or nothing, it needs to start somewhere and then, uh, uh, and then grow, basically. Um, so, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, Lorenzo, Mike, you want to add anything? Yeah, I've got, I, I've got a couple of thoughts. So about the harmonization. So, this is probably the future for us, but what we definitely would like to achieve is from the point of metadata and collecting in central place like Amundsen, we would like to have some sort of standardization or some good practice or some requirements of the type of metadata 
we receive in the central place. Uh, so, for example, every metadata that is ingested needs to have a description, tags, um, needs to have uh, owner's information about how the data could be accessed, uh, what kind of security is around it, what type of data, whether it's uh, uh, some sort of secret data or whether it's more, more we could you know, share the data or not. All of this information needs to, all of these standards needs to be built. This also touches the, you know, the data governance and other components and generally data management. Uh, and also uh, with the harmonization, we, we need to you know, so you go back to the data on the outside. This is something that's being published. So we left, leave everyone to do whatever, almost whatever they want with the data on the inside, what we can on the data outside. And this is the sphere of um, common uh, company, uh, the, you know, the data that belongs to, to everyone. And this is where we want to build some standardization. And, and I've been having some conversations as well uh, recently about um, there's kind of a bridge in between data on the inside and data on the outside as to, you know, um, how does this fit into operational plane versus analytics plane and how does that kind of data on the outside, but it's operational plane stuff start to, to filter back in and that that's not a road that I'm telling people to go down with for data mesh, you know, get get the data mesh, get the, the analytics piece flowing properly before you start to also think about that kind of um, middle data processing type layer that uh, it gets exposed back into the operational. And, and I don't know, maybe you're, you're seeing that these data products um, have operational applications, but that's kind of at least not the first order concern of, of data mesh. To, it's to get them in a shape that they can be used for analytics rather than trying to put it back into operational, especially for near real time operational. I think it's it's an interesting concept, yeah. but. We, we, we really don't see analytics as a special use case at all. It's not more special than any other use case. I, I get what you're saying. And um, some, and, and a lot of that probably emerged into uh, um, uh, analytical use cases of data science teams, needing data to come in, and then all the challenges with data lakes, what have you. Uh, but, but but one thing we're working on, for example, the pricing um, uh, thing. None of the immediate use cases can be described as analytical. They're actually much more transactional. But not really transactional. I don't know where, where they fit. Actually, it's very difficult to pin a label on them, but not a use case where they would go into a massive repository to be ingested by a long-running process, for example. But that's that's possible. That's not excluded. We generally do not see any, any any different. We have this idea of data neutrality. The data is the data. What you do with it, with the same data set, can vary, uh, basically. Uh, but all of this is still emerging, as I said. I mean, I guess one of the our victories, if we can say, is that many of these concepts now have been adopted and spoken about by other people, which is good, like data on the inside and outside and so on. We did a lot of education on that, but we are not yet in a position where we have every single domain uh, with a clear data owner um, and with the data being clearly explored and so on and so forth. And we're trying to rely on use cases to um, prioritize these things, but keeping in mind that whatever we build hopefully can be and you had talked a little bit about it in your QCon presentation, but the, you know, a lot of people are, are trying to figure out how you get people really interested in participating. And, you know, most of the things have been, uh, here's a stick, go, go hit people with the stick instead of here's the carrot. And, and you talked a little bit about that carrot of kind of, getting people bought into the vision of, of what that data mesh can be. So um, would love to hear all of your opinions around that concept as to what can you offer people who are maybe hesitant or saying, isn't this additional work? You know, um, I know within data mesh, you know, you're not just saying, hey, domain, here's a bunch of additional work. It's like, hey, we're going to work with you and we're going to give you, you know, additional resources and stuff. And we're going to make the, the data production our data product production process as easy as possible. Um, but what's the other, what are some other aspects that you've seen that, that are working around getting people bought in? 
Um, I'll, I'll ask Lance, do you want to say something here? Yeah? Well, well, it's re related to this. So we, we were maybe maybe we are lucky. We had good excuses because we have new products. They are have to be developed. Well, have to be developed. They have been chosen to be developed on the cloud, while the most of the organization is on prem. So thing is, uh, uh, the the option we are drawing wires, point to point integration, but they have to be built, custom built for each one of them. Or saying, guys, let's build it properly, and not draw a wire, but make this data available in a, a reasonable way, so the next use case will be able to use it, and let's do it in a more organized way. Um, yeah. I, I don't know, Tarek. Yeah, we, we yeah. Um, so, so there are a few things. Uh, some of them are more related to the transformation. So again, the data mesh for us actually is just the, the data side of the transformation. And if you ask us, we think it's the most important bit, but we are a bit biased. But, but it's part of the transformation. It's not on the side. It's not a technology platform. It's not something we're building for ourselves. So then uh, th there is one is the driver for people to uh, learn new tools and adopt uh, uh, new ways of working is a general one. Then specifically, we also found use cases where uh, with this approach, we are able to build capabilities that were not possible or extremely painful before. For example, the integration of a cloud-based third-party data source and then processing it. So in a previous world, you would have to um, find a way or delegate that or get someone to do it for you in some way or do it in a way that is not automated and what have you. And then ask someone else to process data for you. Whereas the way we did it is to enable the team to understand the data, ingest it, and then start building their own data pipeline to process the data. So that gives a capability and uh, something that did not exist before. We're also lucky by being sponsored by uh, the, the CTO who understands the interest of this for the organization on the, on the longer term. And uh, uh, yeah, the other thing we did is we also tried to combine that with a lot of, not on sound patronizing, but education and sharing. Uh, we also learn a lot about what the data is and we have to adjust our ideas. But also we did not make it very utilitarian. So we don't just tell people, oh, do this thing for me. We actually wanted to go against that. We wanted to help people do better things for themselves. So in terms of the education, we engage in a lot of discussions and design and stuff like that. We also had uh, external speakers coming and presenting about different data topics that are not necessarily uh, within the short or narrow definition of a data mesh and what have you. Um, yeah, so we did a lot of uh, speaking a bit to everyone and then imagining. Um, and this is for me the key step, which is, okay, we sort of now people are converging on imagining what the data mesh would mean or should be or the outline. Uh, but the trick is imagining the journey and step by step, there's an infinity of things you could do. So the trick is just choosing what are the best next things we have to do, uh, basically. Um, so yeah, so this is why it's very difficult to give one recipe, but these are the guiding principles and the heuristics, if you want. And I think we also, the other thing about this is we've been extremely transparent about how we work and why and so on. So not having this transactional relationship with people more trying to understand and work and adapt and things like that. So uh, trying to drive it as opposed to try to uh, impose it. But as I said, you do need the right context, which for us has been the transformation and the right sponsorship. So people understand it's important and it's part of where the company is heading and and so on i, I liked uh into it you know kind of now famous uh blog post on it of the kind of data product marketing questions almost of just going and interviewing you know the potential consumers but also the producers and making them feel seen and heard and be like well, well what well, you know here's what we think you might be able to get out of it and like what are the things that you're blocked on where if we did data better, how could this help you? Yes. Right. And, and, you know, I talked with another person who's very about growing their, their people internally and uh, just talked about resume building and, you know, you may not want, you may not be here forever or, you know, yes, of course we want you, nobody to ever leave and all that stuff, but participating in, uh, you know, data mesh from all angles is something that people are really going to 
be interested in and kind of the data UX and things like that. If you're one of the first people that are really focused on that, you know, data products in general are exploding, data product management as a concept is exploding. Nobody really has a great handle on it. And so if you're able to do that as well, it's just, it's something that, that I'm starting to hear is getting some people bought in. There are always those people who are going to say, you know, no, I'm not going to take on any additional work because of this. And so then you've got to kind of do the stick approach, but th those, those carrots are really interesting. Yeah. I think we also lucky with the size of the company, which is not tiny, but at the same time, it's not uh, as massive as people hiding behind uh, excuses not wanting to do stuff. So, um, so yeah, so in, in terms of the interest of, um, uh, and, and we did a lot of discussion and sort of uh, 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 engagement on, on this, uh, the, the benefits, we again try to link that typically to a short-term benefit sometimes when, when that is possible. So it means you won't need to worry about this or that, and also long-term benefit in terms of how this would evolve because different people are interested in, in different things. The other thing I, I wish we, or I, I hope to hear that we did or surprise people by is things we didn't do. For example, we did not go and tell people that mandate or try to mandate, it's not that we have the ability to mandate, things like, yeah, don't use this database, use the other one because it's our favorite one. We didn't do that. It's, it's almost expected when you have the label data or data engineer that you either do ETL uh, pipelines or you go and tell people what database to use. Um, it, it's not what we, uh, what, what we do. I think we, we're very opinionated, but at the same time, I think we, we hopefully we demonstrated some understanding of the importance of the existing data and so on and so forth. We actually, I believe, I don't know what the others think, but we had to initially pushed this view, which is, yes, yes, we acknowledge and agree that you have to, this hybrid environment, and what we're trying to do is reconcile the two as opposed to uh, uh, separate them more. We, we try not to use the label legacy and new in the cloud, because what we have on premise is not legacy, it's the existing. And what we have on the cloud is not, by definition, better. It might be better automated or have better, more modern technology than have you sometimes, but doesn't mean but automatically one is better and one is worse because of what I did. So yeah, yes, so there is at the data in the problem, not at the technology necessarily. What is the data? Where is the data? Where does it come from? What sort of view do we want to have? What vision do we want to have for this data and how it's utilized? Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to say it's not only mandating, not mandating what databases people should be using, but also is not doing everything uh, for other teams. So the idea is, I all, in my previous jobs, I always was asked, can you just build this database for me? Uh, or can you just uh, deploy something there? Uh, with data mesh, the idea is we could do infrastructure in a way, or you know, this is a necessary requirement for it. So, to, so each distributed team could manage and build their own infrastructure the way they see they, they need. So there's the, the, the challenge is to find the right balance between the autonomy and the, the alignment between the, the what, what the company is using. So, but if we do lots of education and sharing of the experience, people usually tend to reuse the same ways of working, which is very beneficial because then I could go and see different things and help people because I know how it's built. It's built in a common way. Yeah, that that balance is is something that everybody has to strike, and they have to find their own internally and people are kind of like, won't you just tell me what the balance should be? <laughs> and it's like, I'm sorry, can't, but, um, but yeah. And uh, I'm just starting to kind of dig in a little bit around the concept of blueprints for data products, right? Where, where you can enable people and you can say, hey, here's how some other people are doing it. And if you just want to do the exact same thing, boom, you've kind of got a click button type thing. Uh, Microsoft apparently just open sourced something like a couple of days ago around this concept. Um, like what can you do that, that enables them if they don't really care to make all those choices themselves, if they want to, to get your opinion on it, but that you're also not overly prescriptive. And that, that balance is really difficult because there are people who just want to just I, okay, you're telling me I have to do this. I'm just going to get it out the door. Um, so, um, and and I want to be cognizant of, of you all's time. You know, we, we, we've 
already given us, uh, you know, <laughs> an hour and a half of your time. So I, I want to make sure that you're you're able to go and get your dinner. But um, you know, we've got one. Uh, I think last question in in the chat. I don't know if we want to take that yeah. or, or if we want to. There, there, there are a couple that um, uh, about the data schema that I would just like to quickly uh, touch on, although it's important. If that's okay. Okay. Yeah, you, so, yeah you, you've got as much time uh, as you want, but I, uh, I also uh, want to be cognizant. Uh, so th th there is a question about how to manage uh, uh, changes in the schema, especially if you have a pipeline that you cannot stop, for example. Uh, I mentioned Avro as an example, but a few things here. One is that we do not have and we do not see um, one uh, common data model as a good thing or actually as viable. Um, there's it, an example, again, without mentioning names, of an airline that tried just to define a common data model. They realized very quickly, even if flight is impossible to define in a way people agree on, the flight can be the airplane destination and departure at airports, it can be the seating plan, it can be the meals, and can be the technical information about the airplane and so on. And if you define a data model, common data model, unless you have a well understood domain and everything it has been standardized and so on, when you fix something for someone, you break something for someone else. So we do not manage this from top down by mandating common data model and expecting people to align with that. We, we've been for that, and from our experience, it doesn't work. So then the question then, we are in a situation where we have uh, definitely, in terms of defining clear data contracts, and these include the schema at least, but other attributes, it's very important and what we consider as part of, uh, you have to expose as a data owner. So then. What format, what schema, it depends. We use and enable different, um, uh, uh, and people are free to use different uh, uh, data formats. We would like, for example, to agree on, in, in the same situation, not some people to use Protobuf, some people ever want to get an agreement where for a specific class of use cases, there's one. But let's take an example. In the bridge, we are using a format called SVE that um, comes hand in hand with Aaron. <clears throat> SVE is optimized for low latency and compact uh, transfer, works very well for finance-based data, has a schema uh, with some, uh, with the ability to detect that the schema change and so on. So in this specific situation, we know that the schema is fairly, we chose it because it works well within the bridge, we want to optimize for latency, not for consumption by uh, arbitrary consumers, so we chose it. We publish the schemas internally, so you can see them. We also have a library in this specific case that encapsulates some of the schema management aspects, because SP does not provide facilities to, uh, to, to do that automatically. Whereas if you talk about something like Avro, it's much more um, uh, Avro plus schema registry, for example. It, it's really good for something that you put events on Kafka, where you want to manage backward and forward compatibility and so on and so forth. So we do not have one format and it depends on the use case, but we are in favor of strong uh, schema management. And then we use different techniques to do that depending on the, on the use case. Uh, in general, this is again, reminds me of my days uh, working on Spring Web Services, uh, SOAP service and so on. Uh, yeah, you, you, ideally you should allow additive changes and you should not validate for things that you don't want to consume. Uh, so that you can allow consumers to evolve without breaking if you have uh, changes that they're not interested in, for example. Uh, but again, th this is more detailed data engineering uh, um, best practices in terms of schema design. Yeah, we, we, we talked about that a little bit last week in the, in the meetup, and it's a really difficult problem of, are you monitoring for your schema changes at your source systems, and as those are coming in, what is that going to affect into your data product? And then you've got all your transformations, and then you've got the schema changes potentially for that data product. And exactly what you talked about of if you've got registered consumers of your data product, is this schema change, you know, first is the schema change from the source system, is that going to break anything? And, you know, if, if you're only doing data from your own domain, you should be able to really easily know if that source, if that schema change from your own domain is going to break your own domain's data product. So that's where it gets a question of, do you go externally to other domains to get that data? Because then it can get squirrely. 
Um, but then uh, as well, what you talked about, the downstream consumers, if you've got them able to, you know, there, there are people that are doing ad hoc consumption and there are people that are doing regular consumption. And if they're doing ad hoc consumption and there's a change, well, they're doing ad hoc consumption. So they get to consume what's there at that moment, right? So if something changed, they don't, you don't really need to do any versioning or anything like that. And then how do you alert those downstream people of that change has happened, or if you, you know, are doing talking about Git and that kind of thing, you're you're doing a, a branch that you're going to, um, you know, kind of yeah. commit to trunk that you can alert them ahead of time that that schema is going to change and see is this going to break anything and it becomes difficult to to specifically do that. But I think it, as long as you're having good communication up and down, that's yeah. what we're finding is the biggest thing of just like have empathy for your users and have kind of communication and stuff's going to break. And that's kind of part of engineering, right? Like things change, yeah, yeah. things break. Like let's make sure that we're communicating and that we're, we've got SLAs and that we're, we're talking. So one, one idea that we sort of have been thinking about and toying with in, in this of data mesh project, but previously as well, is actually uh, uh, consumer-driven contracts would work even better for data than they work for services. Because the, the, the issue is, is the change, but not the change, is the impact of the change. Is it breaking? And how do you know that any change you have, even if, you, if it's advertised in a schema, is breaking or not? And sometimes you might be, have a compatible schema, but the change can be to the semantics of a value that might um, not be caught by the schema because in general schemas focus a lot on the format rather than on the semantics or the meaning of the data. So having a clear contract on the one hand and then on the other side, having tests that run based on what the consumers do with the data. So consumer driven contracts, we think will work very, very well in this situation. We haven't been in a position yet to uh, uh, implement this and seeing evolving, but I think this is, we think it's promising. Uh, at least we used to, I don't know now, but uh, this can be a way of um, uh, anticipating the impact of change. Uh, plus the usual practices of, yes, everything you mentioned about communication, about schemas, and again, some formats provide uh, uh, ways of handling change more than others uh, <laughs> as well, so. Okay, well, um... So I think it, it, unless there was anything else you wanted to kind of cover a little bit on that, but um, I, I answer some of the questions uh, in writing while you were talking. Oh, thank I'm you. Hoping, okay. Yeah, oh, I'm hoping that made sense. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'll I'll grab that stuff and try and put it into a good format in um, in so that way we can put that for people who are consuming this later or anybody who wants to go back and read through those chats. But um, so. Uh, unless there's anything you want to kind of cover or say before we, we sign off, I'm, I'm really, really appreciative to, for, for the three of you, for everything that you've, uh, you know, all the information that you've imparted upon us, all the, uh, great, great, uh, kind of, um, yeah. stuff about exactly what you're doing, but also kind of what you've seen that's worked and what isn't and, and kind of where you're, you're heading forward. So yeah, um, I'll, I'll yeah, let you go. Do one, one last word to. because there was a question so just one last word about that which is about the adoption and how you get uh people and so on uh to to buy into the data mesh so on um th there's no recipe here and the main thing if, if there's a lot of resistance and there's no buy-in into the transformation itself so if you don't have the background then this might be an uphill task and might be uh, very difficult because the first thing that would change the data mesh is not the technology actually it might not change at all it's how things are done. So there need to be this driver that without being able to handle the data correctly and correctly, at least in a way that allows innovation and so on and requires decentralization. And often the driver can be scaling or innovation or both, then uh, it's very difficult. Then in terms of the day-to-day -day techniques, it's again, a combination of what I described in terms of uh, uh, engaging with people, education, uh, we, we also put a lot of emphasis on um, hands-on uh, empirical uh, uh, trying things and then critiquing what we try rather than just, we, we like debating and discussing a lot, but we also like taking something, implementing it, and then uh, bring it back to delivery uh, as well. Uh, and then uh, just choosing deliverables that will allow you, that will add up and contribute to delivering data mesh. So 
uh, this is more probably we use our consultancy background uh, in, in, in that. So, um, yeah, that's what I have to say about that. But definitely this topic keeps coming back again and again because I think it's one of the biggest challenges in data mesh and, and maybe it's worth at some point specific event or a panel, uh, Scott, uh, different people maybe sharing on that. Yeah, I think also that uh, some work on, on uh, cloud or infrastructure oh, is yeah. also very, very important because uh, people might think that, you know, building their own data systems is just outside of the, 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 the comfort zone or maybe it's just something they've never done before uh, or just the, you know, just the concept of, uh, of um, you know, owning the infrastructure might be might be quite challenging to many people. But if we build some sort of shared capabilities, uh, at least uh, achieve or go in the direction of self service, this is definitely helpful for people to to get on board and and start doing it. Strong agree. Yeah. Okay. Well, great thank you point. again, everybody, and uh, thank you. You know, thanks for all the attendees for the great questions and everything and. We'll have this up uh, as uh, relatively soon on the YouTube. So, and thanks everybody. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting us. Thanks for organizing this. And thanks everyone for listening and bearing with us and being patient. So, <laughs> I second that. Thank you. <laughs>